It was noon, Easter Sunday in the Russian Orthodox calendar, when children outside Chuflea Church started throwing rocks at Jews who had come to watch the holiday festivities. Then the adults joined in. Within a couple of hours, students from the Orthodox seminary had come out in their vestments, many of them drunk, urging the crowds against the Jewish community. Jewish businesses near the church, all of them closed for Passover, were destroyed first. Liquor stores, then tobacco shops, then any Jewish-owned business was targeted as far as the new market. By 4 p.m., priests had come out to lead the crowd to houses and apartment buildings, chanting, Christ has risen, and death to Jews, and attacking anyone found on the streets without a crucifix. At one point, the crowd broke into a Jewish butcher shop and held aloft a slab of beef which they claimed to be the remains of a Christian child. At this time, most of Kishinev didn't have electricity, so the crowd moved steadily and systematically in the dark. Seminary students in particular presided over gang rapes of Jewish women and girls that lasted hours, often forcing their husbands and children to watch for maximum humiliation, and demanding that anyone they found pay for their lives. Any man found not to have money was either beaten to death or was variously maimed and dismembered. Some wealthier Jews boarded trains out of the city, hid out in nearby hotels, or successfully barricaded their homes to keep their assailants out. And make no mistake, many poorer families banded together, armed themselves as best as they could, and successfully fought off their attackers. But such acts of self-defense were retroactively used as justifications for the violence and they were forcibly disarmed by police. By the morning of the 20th, rumors had spread that the imperial government had mandated three days of violence against the Jewish community, and so it escalated. Those who had attacked Jewish homes the day before returned with wagons to loot as much as possible. Priests and their students returned to rushing apartments and raping the women they found inside. By the end of the day, 900 of the rioters had been arrested, but many police precincts refused to intervene, believing that the mass violence was justified. Because of this, the true scope of the pogrom wasn't initially well understood, and despite his best intentions, provincial governor Rudolf von Robin was totally unequipped to confront it. So even as Russian troops entered the city to restore order, the worst was still to come. That evening it began to rain, raising hopes that the poor weather would prevent further violence. But by sunrise on the 21st, the skies had cleared, and the deadliest day began. Photographs of the time show the streets laden either with loot for the taking, or with the wounded and dead. As the riots spread to the slums of Lower Kishinev, neighbors and friends suddenly became assailants caught up in the mania of the pogrom. Unable to find many valuables in such a poor area, the attackers were content to simply destroy the homes, rape the women, and kill the men. Finally, shortly before sunset, the army secured control of the city and declared martial law. It had taken them over 24 hours. Altogether, 49 people were killed over three days. At least 40 rapes were reported, including two underage girls who were raped to death. But this is certain to be an undercount. In addition, nearly 600 were injured, 92 seriously so, over 1,500 buildings were damaged or destroyed, and over 10,000 survivors were left homeless. In certain ways, this was just another iteration of a familiar pattern in Russian Jewish history. The pogrom, a method of violence so structured and predictable that British newspapers 20 years earlier had already outlined how they happen. Like most pogroms, this one took place during Easter, when religious tensions were at their highest. As usual, they were accompanied by accusations that the Jews were making human sacrifices for Passover. As usual, there was a persistent rumor that the attacks were endorsed by the government. And as usual, the violence lasted three days. But in all other respects, Kishinev was quite different. Though earlier pogroms in the Russian Empire had resulted in fatalities, this was the first in which murder was an explicit objective. That such atrocities had taken place in Kishinev of all places was shocking in itself, for not only was it a predominantly Jewish city, but its remoteness from the centers of power and proximity to the porous border had made it one of the most tolerant cities of the empire, having largely avoided the widespread pogroms of the 1880s. 
But as a new century dawned, a struggling journalist named Pavel Khrushchevan had managed to buy the local newspaper Bessarabits and turn it into a mouthpiece for anti-Semitic propaganda, both racial and religious. When Bessarabia's agricultural sector was hit hard by a sudden drop in food prices, Khrushchevan attributed this to the Jews, whom he viewed as distant, alien, dark-skinned oppressors controlling all aspects of life from the loathsome capital of his otherwise utopian province. Soon after, when a Christian child was found stabbed to death in the nearby town of Dubasari, Khrushchevan seized on this as proof of Jewish human sacrifice. Never mind that an older cousin confessed to having the boy murdered over an inheritance. As far as Khrushchevan was concerned, even the police who caught him were Jewish agents. And when tensions reached their peak at Easter, Khrushchevan even sent associates to rile up the crowd further. Unprecedented in its savagery, Word of the Kishinev pogrom quickly spread beyond the borders of the empire, where it was greeted with almost universal outrage. And for the next 35 years, most of the world would recognize Kishinev not as the name of a city, but as the defining tragedy of the Jewish people in the 20th century. Like the massacre itself, the response to Kishinev in the Jewish world was at once familiar and unexpected. Over the previous century, Jewish communities around the world had rallied around a series of crises and causes, but the response to Kishinev went far beyond any of those affairs. This was even more impressive because the Jewish world of 1903 was more politically and religiously divided than it had been at any time since the days of the Temple. Transcending those divisions can largely be attributed to the Jews of Russia. For a little over a century, the Russian Empire had been home to the world's largest Jewish population. Yet, for most of that period, they had been almost entirely shut out of the wider Jewish conversation. Confined almost entirely to the western fringe of the empire, largely isolated from their brethren abroad, and subjected to frequent outbursts of public violence and an ever-changing list of discriminatory laws, the Jews of Russia were on average poorer, less educated, and less politically active than their fellow Jews almost anywhere else. In more recent decades, expanding access to education had steadily created a modest Jewish middle class, and recent mass emigration to Britain and America had brought far greater visibility to the Russian Jewish experience. Despite its unprecedented severity, Kishinev would probably have faded into obscurity if it had taken place a generation earlier. But even in April 1903, the vast majority of Jews in the empire remained voiceless and depoliticized. Kishinev finally changed that. On the 18th of May, while much of Kishinev remained in ruins, the Times of London republished an alleged letter indicating that Governor Robin had received advanced warning of the pogrom from none other than Interior Minister Vyacheslav von Pleva. The massacre, it seemed, had come from the highest levels of government. Only many years later, when imperial records were unsealed, was it discovered that the letter had been a forgery. Though he made no secret of his hatred for Jews, Pleva was a law and order conservative who desired peace above all, as demonstrated when he promptly recalled Robin and replaced him with Prince Sergei Orusov, a liberal aristocrat of such commitment and integrity that he remained popular and employed through all three Russian revolutions. But there was a reason the letter was so readily believed, both by the Jewish community and by their attackers. Working under the new emperor Nikolai II, the Russian cabinet had successfully presented an image of the Russian military as not only the largest in the world, but the strongest, exactly the type of existential threat to the West that Nikolai's forebears had dreamed of creating. In reality, the Russian military of 1903 was the weakest among the great powers the least disciplined, the least coordinated, with extremely low morale and no training whatsoever for urban environments like Kishinev. This would become very clear very soon. But in 1903, the myth of Russian military supremacy persisted both domestically and abroad, leaving ordinary people at a loss to explain why the invincible Russian army had taken so long to secure their own city. Among both Jews and Gentiles, a common phrase was uttered in difficult times, if only the emperor knew. 
Every Friday night in the synagogue, rabbis would recite a prayer for the emperor. Any time something went wrong in the country, there was a general belief that he was simply too far removed from regular society to respond to the problem. And with that belief came the lingering hope that he could make things better. That hope was gone forever. As news of the pogrom began filtering out of the empire, public outrage erupted all over the Western world. When it came to international relations, Russian authoritarianism had been a liability for decades. Even most countries that were nominally allied with Russia, like France and Bulgaria, had worked hard to keep their distance politically. But with Kishinev, Russia devolved into a genuine pariah state. Nowhere was the outrage more keenly felt than in the United States. Over the previous 18 years, the ports of New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore had received over 700,000 Jewish immigrants, already the largest migration in Jewish history. Most of those immigrants had come from the Russian Empire. Many of them had experienced pogroms themselves, some had even come from Kishinev, and the New Immigrant Society of America's industrial cities had developed complex ecosystems of businesses, charities, multilingual newspapers, and clubs ready and willing to rally their communities in the face of injustices both domestically and abroad. Within two months of the pogrom, the socialist Jewish Daily Forward, just one of many Jewish newspapers in New York alone, had raised half a million dollars to help rebuild Kishinev. Protest marches were quickly organized in almost every major city, and even some minor ones. And in these efforts, American Jews did not march alone. News of Kishinev particularly struck a nerve with Chinese immigrants, who knew all too well the perils of Russian aggression and life under an absolutist emperor. Living side by side on the Lower East Side, Chinese American leaders like the Republican revolutionary Joseph Singleton welcomed their Jewish neighbors to hold rallies and fundraisers at Chinese theaters and restaurants, forming the basis of a special relationship between Jewish and Chinese New Yorkers that persists to this day. Soon, even Protestant ministers and Catholic bishops were rallying behind the Jewish cause, eager to show the world exactly what they thought of the kind of Christianity practiced by the mob in Kishinev. Meanwhile, Russian diplomats and state media lambasted the hypocrisy of Americans' outrage in the face of their own pogroms against black people. But many American Jews, like the progressive financier Jacob Schiff and activist rabbi Stephen Wise, happily accepted that as a challenge, later becoming founding board members of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. By June, the avalanche of letters and petitions in support of the Jewish cause had reached the offices of President Theodore Roosevelt, who, while vacationing on Long Island, agreed to hold a meeting with Simon Wolf, one of many Jewish officials appointed during the presidency of Ulysses S. Grant, now serving as president of the American Jewish aid organization B'nai B'rith. President Roosevelt was among the first of a bold new wave of American politicians who had come of age after the Civil War who had helped transform the United States into a great power, and who lacked the diplomatic timidity of earlier generations. Though Roosevelt didn't dare risk severing relations with Russia, he wasn't afraid of telling them where he stood, and remained committed to forwarding the sentiments of the American people to Emperor Nikolai. Even when the emperor communicated that he would reject such a petition, Roosevelt felt that the message would still be clear. Jewish immigrants found yet another unlikely ally in the politician and newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst. While it needs to be acknowledged that Hearst eventually became a hardcore reactionary and Nazi sympathizer, in 1903 he was anything but, having just been elected to Congress as a member of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Though only in his first year of elected office, Hearst was already planning to run for president in 1904, and likely saw Kishinev as a way to secure the Jewish vote in a general election against the progressive Republican Roosevelt. To that end, Hearst commissioned the Irish nationalist politician and muckraking journalist Michael Davitt to go to Kishinev and report his findings for the New York American. At the same time, the leading Jewish intellectuals of Odessa had sent the poet Chaim Nachman Bialik to undertake his own investigation of the pogrom. Within a year, both men would publish damning reports. 
Davit with an extensive and shockingly gruesome investigative report, and Bialik in the form of his epic poem In the City of Slaughter. Though the two men varied in their approaches, in one matter they agreed emphatically, that the true scale of the pogrom was only possible because of the cowardice of Jewish men. Jewish men appear, except in rare instances, to have acted as contemptible cowards. In no instance have I heard from women of any courageous stand being made either by their husbands or sons. Several of these miserable poltroons came to my hotel to recount their marvellous escapes, but no one had a story of courage or of counter-attack to relate. Crushed in their shame, they saw it all. They did not stir nor move. They did not pluck their eyes out. They beat not their brains against the wall. Perhaps, perhaps, each watcher had it in his heart to pray. A miracle, O Lord, and spare my skin this day. Those who survived this foulness, who from their blood awoke, beheld their life polluted, the light of their world gone out. Leaving aside the documented instances of self-defense which I mentioned at the beginning of this video, both David and Bialik were speaking to anxieties over Jewish masculinity that had been percolating for decades. A creeping notion that centuries of diaspora and religious abstraction had trained Jewish men to always live in fear, to be on their best behavior, and to avoid rocking the boat even in defense of their own lives. As the leading Zionist philosopher of the time, Bialik's mentor, Achad Ha'am, had spent nearly two decades extolling the virtues of the Sabra, the vanguard of a renewed native Jewish society in Palestine who works the land himself and embraces its physical and cultural nature. Ha'am's erstwhile rival, Max Nordau, built on this idea in 1900, when he wrote an article calling for what he called muscular Judaism, defined by athleticism and militarism. Though Ha'am and Nordau were Zionists, the concept of muscular Judaism also applied to the Bundists and other autonomists. And while prominent Jewish athletes and military men were nothing new, the years following Kishinev would see an explosion of professional Jewish sporting clubs, culminating in 1921 with the foundation of the Maccabi World Sport Union, the first organization dedicated to promoting and showcasing Jewish athleticism. The rise of muscular Judaism also ensured that when the next pogrom came, Jewish communities were ready for them. On the 30th of July, 1903, Yuli Martov opened the Second Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party in Brussels. Due to pressure from the local Russian embassy, Belgian authorities quickly forced the Congress to relocate to London. But wherever they were, five of the party delegates were feeling unusually confident in their position. Together, Arkady Kramer, Vladimir Medem, Vladimir Kosovsky, Mark Lieber, and Noah Portnoy represented the General Jewish Labor Bund, one of several regional and ethnic parties within the party, which called for the establishment of an autonomous Jewish polity in a future socialist Russia. A decade earlier, the Bund had been one of the most active and popular socialist movements in the Russian Empire. And while the mainstream Social Democrats had since surpassed them in numbers, leaders Kramer and Medem regarded the Kishinev pogrom as evidence for their importance to the movement. Whereas David and Bialik attacked the general cowardice of Jewish men to stand up to their assailants, the Bund took aim at the cowardice of the Jewish bourgeoisie who had fled the city by train or hidden behind the heavy metal doors of their well-appointed apartments with no consideration for the suffering of those left behind in the marketplaces and the northern slums. For Kramer, the Bund's chief organizer, and Medem, its chief philosopher, the intersection of class and ethnicity at Kishinev crystallized their platform more clearly than anything that had come before. And on the 27th session of the Congress in London, they presented that platform in a single sentence. The Bund is the social democratic organization of the Jewish proletariat, enters the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party as its sole representative, and is not subject to any geographical restriction. But despite the approval of similar autonomous platforms at the Congress, the Bund's proposal was unequivocally defeated, 41 to 5, with 5 abstaining. This was a crushing betrayal. Martov, 
the leader of the overall party, had been instrumental in the very establishment of the Bund. Yet after years of helping build up the movement, he'd left them out to dry. In protest, the five Bundists walked out of the Congress never to return. And in so doing, they changed the course of history. When it wasn't dealing with matters of national autonomy, the Congress was exposing a severe ideological rift between Martov and his erstwhile friend and deputy, Vladimir Lenin. Officially, the divide began over the management of the party's official newspaper, Iskra, but that issue quickly revealed itself as a mere proxy for a much larger debate over the nature of the party as a whole. Martov was emphatic about the need for collective decision-making, and wanted to include as many people from the working class of the empire as possible. By contrast, Lenin favored leadership by a small core of dedicated intellectuals who could then activate the working class at large, a concept later known as vanguardism. Not coincidentally, the vast majority of Lenin's supporters in the matter were ethnic Russians, including a surprisingly large number of middle-class gentry and aristocrats. When it came to longer-term issues, Lenin believed that the Russian Empire could fully transition into communism at any time. Martov didn't. Serfdom may have ended officially decades earlier, but the vast majority of imperial subjects still lived on farms under a continued feudal regime, and Martov believed that Russia couldn't become communist without first becoming capitalist. For most of the Congress, this debate had gone unresolved. But in the absence of his Bundist allies, Martov lost his majority to Lenin. And while the ideological battle between the two wasn't over, it was ultimately Lenin and his majority, or in Russian, Bolsheviks, who would dominate and overpower Martov and his minority, or Mensheviks. After the Congress, Lenin wasted no time in condemning the Bund. Today, we might call his attitude colorblind or post-racial. While he was always quick and emphatic to condemn anti-Semitism in the empire and within the party, he was just as quick to dismiss proactive responses to racial and ethnic injustice as ethnocentric and reactionary. And that's exactly the tone he adopted in his farewell to the Bund. But despite Lenin's prognostications, the Bund continued to grow and thrive. At the same time their leaders had been sparring in London, local Bund activists had been tirelessly organizing and training Jewish self-defense forces in anticipation of the next wave of pogroms. They weren't alone in this effort. Expelled from the Bund two years earlier for their Zionist allyship, Ber Borochov's Zionist Socialist Workers' Union was also crucial to organizing a proactive self-defense. They also adopted a new name, the Jewish Social Democratic Labor Party, or Poalezion. But for the most part, it was the Bund who organized these committees, and it worked. That September, pogromists fell upon the majority Jewish city of Gomel and were either driven away or killed. A month after leaving the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, the Bund were being celebrated as heroes. On the 23rd of August, an unexpectedly haggard Theodor Herzl opened the 6th Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. As one might expect, he had much to say about Kishinev, and particularly the urgency that it placed on the Zionist movement to establish a firm path to a legally assured Jewish homeland. Kishinev exists wherever Jews undergo bodily or spiritual torture, wherever their self-respect is injured and their property despoiled because they are Jews. Let us save those who can still be saved. Herzl had good reason to worry. While most of the world continued to regard him as the face of Zionism, he had long since become a pariah within his own movement. His disdain for the already successful revival of Hebrew, his disregard for the socialist majority, and most especially his egotistical and unscrupulous tactics for advancing the cause, had reduced him to little more than a figurehead. Now he would receive his greatest defeat, and his last. At the Congress, Herzl brought forth news of a meeting he'd had with British Colonial Secretary Joseph Chamberlain. For the previous 20 years, Britain's government had been highly sympathetic to the plight of Jews in Eastern Europe, with Britain itself being the second most popular destination for British refugees. But by 1903, that popularity had become a political liability. 
Over 23 years, Britain's Jewish population had quadrupled. East London neighborhoods like Whitechapel were now majority Jewish. There was also a growing backlash from textile workers who feared competition from these new arrivals. And indeed, in just two years, new laws would cut off Jewish immigration to Britain almost entirely. So by entertaining Herzl, Chamberlain saw an opportunity to solve both of their problems. But he wasn't in any position to deal with the Ottoman Empire. Instead, he came up with another, much stranger idea to create a temporary Jewish homeland in Wasin Gishu, a small county on the recently conquered Mao escarpment in British East Africa. Because Chamberlain had mentioned surveying the territory from the newly built Uganda Railway, Herzl erroneously introduced his proposal to the Zionist Congress as the Uganda Scheme. Rarely had the Congress been more revolted by Herzl's antics. Even many of those who had otherwise stood by him through all the other battles finally abandoned him. Herzl and his close confidant Max Nordau were adamant that the Uganda scheme would only be a temporary solution, characterizing it as a way station on the path to a permanent Jewish state in Palestine. But few were reassured by such promises. There was no historical precedent for establishing a temporary national homeland. And despite recent efforts by the Ottoman Empire to suppress Jewish settlement in Palestine, the Yishuv was growing and thriving. Palestine was also the source of Jewish culture. What was Wasin Gishu to the Jewish people but an arbitrary spot on the map? Not even Herzl's invocations of Kishinev could move the Congress to his side. In fact, it was the delegates from the Russian Empire that most adamantly opposed the Uganda scheme, including the delegates from Kishinev. Realizing the magnitude of his opposition, Herzl pivoted, instead merely proposing a committee to investigate the possibility of resettlement in Wasingishu. And while he did secure a plurality vote in favor, a subsequent walkout by 128 delegates from the Russian Empire forced him to drop the issue, if only to prevent the Zionist movement from self-destructing. Less than three weeks after the end of the Congress, Chamberlain resigned as colonial secretary taking any possibility of a Jewish home in East Africa with him. Herzl's uncharacteristic admission of defeat was more than just political necessity. A year earlier, he'd been diagnosed with a severe heart condition, sending him into a rapid physical decline. He left Basel at the end of August as determined as ever, but in less than a year, Theodor Herzl would be dead. Pavel Khrushchevan didn't start out this way. Kishinev, the provincial capital which he so hated, was actually where he'd grown up, and where he'd attended school with Romanian, Russian, and Jewish classmates. In his earliest adulthood, he'd even been an outspoken liberal. But his literary career stalled. Frequent brushes with bankruptcy and the constant need to conceal his homosexuality aggravated his already deteriorating mental health. And as anti-Semitic attitudes began to surge in the empire under Emperor Alexander III, the notion of Jewish domination and destruction of the Russian Empire meshed well with his own personal grievances. Influenced by the growing anti-Semitic movements in Germany and France and the growing popularity of eugenics, Khrushchevan began developing his own unique brand of social Darwinism. He came to believe that Jews were an evolutionary dead end, in his own words, the left hand of the organism of humanity. In his 1896 travel guide to the Russian Empire, he mused frequently about the evils of the Jews and concluded that anti-Semitism was the natural state of humanity. Anyone who professed not to hate Jews had to be either mentally unfit or paid off, from ordinary citizens to politicians like finance minister Sergei Vita, and indeed entire countries who dared to criticize Russia. In his eyes, only the emperor was incorruptible, if only he knew. To Khrushchevan, there was only one practical solution. Just as in Spain and Portugal centuries earlier, the Jews had to be either expelled or forcibly assimilated, just as his Romanian grandparents had been forcibly assimilated under Nikolai I. Only when Jewish identity was totally eradicated, he believed, could the Russian Empire be united as a single race under an absolute ruler chosen by God and take its rightful place as master of the world. And this kind of talk proved very lucrative. 
Following the success of his travel guide, Khrushchevan began buying up small newspapers across the empire, including his local Bessarabits, and transforming them into vehicles for non-stop incitement against Jews. By the time David and Bialik had arrived in Kishinev, Khrushchevan had long since fled to St. Petersburg, hiding out in a small apartment and taking a step back from managing his newspapers. To some, this might seem like a setback, but Khrushchevan rejoiced in his newfound status as the monster of Kishinev. This was exactly the kind of fame and recognition he'd always dreamed of, even if that meant that most of the world hated him. In his diminishing mental state, this only confirmed his increasingly elaborate beliefs. It was time to cash in. Like many angry middle-class men who think they know a lot more about politics than they actually do, Khrushchevan had become convinced that everything he disliked and resented, from geopolitics to table manners, could be boiled down to a single point of societal failure, which for him was obviously Jews. Decades of eroding public order in the empire? Jews. Russia's international isolation? Jews. The rising popularity of socialism? Jews. The rise of capitalism? Jews. War was a Jewish conspiracy. Peace was a Jewish conspiracy. The Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment, the Protestant Reformation, and most especially democracy. All Jewish conspiracies to destroy God's chosen nation, Russia. It's not clear when exactly, but sometime shortly before the Kishinev pogrom, Khrushchevan came into possession of the dialogue in hell between Machiavelli and Montesquieu, an obscure 1864 French satire of Emperor Napoleon III which, divorced from its original context, had recently gained currency among Russian reactionary intellectuals as evidence of a vast Jewish conspiracy to control humanity. Despite this interpretation, the dialogue in hell contained no references to Jews whatsoever, and even Khrushchevan doubted the work's authenticity. Nevertheless, from St. Petersburg he began rewriting the text as an explicitly anti-Jewish work and republishing it in installments in his newspapers. Attributing his work to first-hand accounts of Theodor Herzl, Achad Ha'am, an aide to King Solomon, and a non-existent organization called the World Union of Freemasons and Sages of Zion, Khrushchevan's Protocols of the Elders of Zion posited that the previous 3,000 years of human history and progress were nothing but a carefully executed plot orchestrated by the world's Jews to destroy all religion and enslave humanity. As Khrushchevan saw it, the rising tide of liberalism, socialism, and Zionism demonstrated the imminent threat of a global, atheistic, borderless superstate separating humanity from God through the heresies of democracy and human rights. Despite Khrushchevan's newfound popularity, the Protocols lingered in obscurity until after his death, leaving his role in its authorship in question for the better part of a century. But his sentiment still echoed a widespread anger in Russia. While Khrushchevan openly acknowledged that he incited the pogrom and that he had intended to have Jews killed for the sake of being Jews, he and many others still maintained that they were the real victims. Accordingly, the autumn of 1903 saw a resurgence of pogroms, not only in Gomel, but Smela, Feodosia, Melitopol, and Zablotov. The self-defense committees created by the Bund and Poelezion fought back as best as they could. But as 1903 drew to a close, it became clear that despite the best intentions of the wider world, the Jews of Russia were still on their own. Tensions between Russia and Japan had been building up for years. It was already certain that war between the two countries would break out any day. And it was also clear that Russia's diplomatic isolation would keep the other great powers from intervening. What's more, Japanese intelligence had already disproven the myth of Russia's military invincibility. The only question now was whether the great powers would tolerate a preemptive strike on the Russian Pacific Fleet at Port Arthur. And on this point, the Japanese cabinet had been intractably divided. Finally, on the 5th of February, Army Minister Tarauchi Masatake entered the cabinet meeting with a translated article from the Nobel Prize winning Norwegian poet Björnstjerne Björnsson condemning the Kishinev pogrom as the act of a failed state and all but inviting any willing great power to declare war and put the Russian Empire out of its misery. Here at last was the propaganda tactic that would make a preemptive strike palatable to the rest of the world. <laughs> 
a war of liberation. History takes revenge. Three days later, the attack on Port Arthur commenced. Special thanks to my patrons, including Matthew Von Abo, Mir Akbar Ali, Jeremy Biskin, Boris Cherney, F.C., Jay Fleischman, Osha Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Jacob Kossoff, and Eric Liederman. <laughs>